George Washington was the only founding father to free his slaves, but freedom means different things depending on your perspective. If a person is free and his family is still enslaved, is he really free? In this video, we look at George Washington's struggle with his views on slavery, his treatment on his slaves, and his seemingly contradictory reasons for waiting until his death to free them. First, we start with his teeth. Yes, his dentures. Trust me. Washington had a dental problem. Starting when he was 24, he lost all of his teeth, except one molar, before he was first elected president. That last remaining dental vestige was also removed shortly after. Washington had long worn false teeth. First, let's dispel a myth about as popular as the hacking of the cherry tree. Washington did not have wooden teeth. This myth likely started because Washington was a prodigious imbiber of port, which tended to quickly add a wooden look to his dentures. Luckily for Washington, the implantation of false teeth and the manufacture of dentures became a reality in Europe in the early to mid-1700s and quickly became available in the American colonies. Washington had several sets of dentures during his lifetime, only one of which is still known to exist and is displayed at Mount Vernon. Dentures in the 18th century were not made with porcelain or other unknown synthetic substances. Instead, they were made with animal and human teeth. Human teeth would find their way in the dentures that might also include the teeth of hippopotami, cows, horses, and of ivory. When a patient received a set of dentures, it was impossible to tell from where the teeth had come, and since only the rich could afford dentures, they likely didn't want to know. Dentists acquired their human teeth either via normal extraction or through ads, ads that promised to pay for teeth delivered to them, causing both white and black poor to sell their teeth. This was a common practice, which leads to the Washington denture controversy. In a 1784 Mount Vernon ledger entry, Lund Washington, Washington's distant cousin and manager of Mount Vernon during the Revolution, made the following entry. More clearly, by cash, paid Negroes for nine teeth to be purchased by Dr. Lamois. When this became public a few years ago, many lost their minds, claiming that Washington had ripped teeth out of the mouths of his slaves so he could use them in his teeth, and he never actually paid for them. Well, first, Lund might have encouraged the slaves to sell their teeth, but it's unlikely that the teeth were not paid for. As I discuss later, Washington regularly paid his slaves for products and services. Second, there's no evidence that the teeth ever made it into Washington's mouth. Lemoyne was a dentist known for making dentures for the rich, buying human teeth when he could. He was also a friend of Washington, who might have arranged the sale simply to do his friend a favor. These teeth could have ended up in anyone's mouth, just like the other teeth from free blacks and whites purchased off the street. The significant difference is what was paid. It appears that Lamois paid Washington about a third of what teeth went for on the open market. So while it's possible that Washington had the teeth of black people in his mouth, it cannot be proved that the teeth sold to Lamois ended up in his dentures. But this quickly leads to a discussion about Washington overall as a slave owner. Washington lived in a place and time in which slavery was largely accepted. He was thrust into slave ownership in 1743 at the age of 11 when he inherited 10 slaves upon his father's death. By 1754, Washington had purchased an additional 16 slaves. This was also the year he leased Mount Vernon from his half-brother's widow, Anne, including all slaves on the property. Washington became the owner of Mount Vernon upon Anne's death in 1761. The chief crop at Mount Vernon at the time was tobacco, a product that required a significant amount of field labor. In 1759, Washington married the very wealthy Martha Dandridge Custis. Martha brought to the marriage 84 dower slaves, slaves that were hers to use until her death when they would return to the Custis family. Further, Washington bought 13 additional slaves that year 
and another 42 from 1761 to 1773. By law and custom, George took over management of Martha's dower slaves, making his total slave workforce quite large by the start of the Revolutionary War, given his additional purchases and the children born to married slaves. We know that George personally owned 150 slaves at that time. Washington did not believe that blacks were lesser creatures. Instead, he believed they had the same potential for success, for contributing to society, as did whites, if given the proper education and training. While he was a strict slave master, doling out whippings and other punishments when he thought appropriate, Washington took reasonable care of his slaves, keeping them fed, housed, and clothed, at least until later in the War of the Revolution. He also paid them for extra work, hunted game, garden produce, and livestock they might have raised themselves. In short, Washington was an example of what might have been considered at the time in Virginia as a fair and just slave owner, but what today we might consider an oxymoron. His continued purchases of slaves implies that Washington was a total proponent of slavery, but this was not the case. Why his attitude was changing was likely focused more on economic challenges than humanitarian ones. In 1763, Washington began reducing the amount of tobacco he grew, stopping its cultivation entirely by 1766, resulting in far less need for slaves. As his farms moved to grow hemp and flax, the slaves were trained in skills such as weaving and carpentry, making Mount Vernon self-sustainable. However, he tried to find ways to reduce the number of slaves he owned, thereby decreasing his cost of doing business. Washington's plans to free his slaves were apparently blocked at every turn because up to 70% of them were married or had other close family tar ties to Martha's dower slaves, slaves he could not legally free or sell. This would result in something Washington claimed he would never do, break up families. He also would not sell his slaves if that meant breaking up families. For example, he was reluctant to sell his slaves at public auction. In his own words, If these poor wretches are to be held in a state of slavery, I do not see that a change of masters will render it any more irksome, provided husband and wife and parents and children are not separated from each other, which is not my intention to do. As we see later, Washington's promises to keep families together eventually fell apart. At the beginning of the Revolutionary War, Washington had begun to look at other ways to subsist that did not involve slaves. It still isn't yet clear whether this was purely economic or humanitarian. In late 1776, after barely escaping with his army across the Delaware River, Washington told his Mount Vernon manager to avoid purchasing cloth for his slaves because the then exorbitant prices. The, as the war progressed, shortages and rising costs pushed Washington even further toward ridding himself of his human chattel. In 1778, he wrote, I every day long more and more to get rid of Negroes, as he proposed an exchange of slaves for land, clearly stating, I wish to get quit of Negroes. It's likely the biggest reasons for Washington's post-war views on slavery were Alexander Hamilton, the Marquis de, de Lafayette, and John Lawrence. In one way or another, these three close colleagues of Washington during the war often spoke of releasing slaves, making a case for freeing blacks based on the principles for which Washington and his army were fighting. This was especially true of Lafayette, who visited Mount Vernon after the war working with Washington to find a way to free his slaves without a severe, unwanted impact on slave families and plantation economics. A visitor to Mount Vernon in 1784 recalled a conversation between Lafayette and Washington, in which Lafayette told Washington that putting an end to slavery would give the finishing stroke and policy to your political characters. Lafayette was appealing to Washington's known penchant, for maintaining his reputation. Lafayette's visit was followed in 1785 by a visit from Francis Ashbury, the first bishop of the Methodist Church in America. Ashbury later claimed that Washington told him that he was against slavery. 
Also in 1785, the Virginia Quaker slave owner, Robert Pleasance, freed his slaves and made Washington aware of both the reasons and why all slaves should be free. These and other events apparently moved Washington to the anti-slavery side of the ledger. In 1786, he said, I can only say that there is not a man living who wishes more sincerely than I do to see a plan adopted for this abolition of slavery. But there is only one proper and effectual mode by which it can be accomplished, and that is by legislative authority. Washington also informed a fellow planter that his intent was never to purchase another slave. This brings us to the question, why didn't Washington try to free all slaves as president? As we've seen, Washington was working through his personal relationship with slavery while president. So it isn't surprising that he did not work hard to emancipate the slaves during his presidency, or to do so with what what would have been likely a highly problematic executive order. History shows us that Washington was concerned that releasing the slaves would divide the country, would destroy the new republic, a view also held later by Lincoln. His desire to see the new country persist outweighed any inclination he might have had to free the slaves. There was also a political element. Washington needed the support of slave owners for his presidency and his re-election. It was politically unfeasible to abolish slavery. However, While he publicly supported slave owners, supporting fugitive slave laws, he apparently had his staff participate in closed-door requests to Congress to take up the slave issue. Upon his death in 1799, Washington finally crossed his Rubicon, releasing his 160 slaves in his last will and testament, contingent upon the death of Martha. Delaying the release prevented Mount Vernon upheaval during Martha's life, and temporarily kept slave families together. Unlike the release during a civil war, Washington took steps to ensure slaves unable to fend for themselves were taken care of. The elderly, unable to work, would continue to receive subsistence. Children without parents, or whose families were too poor or indifferent to see to their education, would be bound as apprentices until the age of 25 with the requirement that a master and his wife taking on a child would be responsible for teaching him a trade as well as reading and writing. And finally, none of the slaves would, could be sold. William Lee, Washington's manservant, was released immediately with a $30 annual stipend and the option to stay on in his current position. He would receive the stipend whether he stayed or left. Washington was was required by a 1782 Virginia law to support freed slaves financially if they were either minors or elderly. However, his provision for educating them was in addition to what he was legally bound to do. He also was the only founding father to free his slaves, either while alive or in their wills. Apparently fearing that Georgia's slaves were plotting to kill her to gain their freedom, Martha decided to free the slaves before her death, signing the manumission paperwork on December 15, 1800. The actual release date was January 1, 1801. Martha didn't hate the slaves, and her feelings toward them were similar to George's. This might have resulted in a better overall outcome, but the law was in the way. As we've seen, Washington did not want to break up the families. We've also seen that about half of the slaves at Mount Vernon were Martha's dower slaves and that George's and Martha's slaves had largely intermarried, creating strong family ties. These conditions created severe challenges. Upon the release of George's slaves, some remained behind to take care of their families, a temporary arrangement. When Martha died on May 22, 1802, her slaves were returned to the, Cust- to the Custis family without gaining their freedom, and were divided among her four grandchildren. This resulted in the same outcome Washington always said he wanted to prevent, splitting families. It's important to note that it doesn't appear that Washington ever attempted to purchase Martha's dower slaves that had family connections with his own. So what can we conclude from this story? First, Washington became a slave owner early in his life carrying with him from that young age the beliefs and customs of the Virginia planter culture. Before the Revolutionary War, 
he appears to have behaved and thought like his planter peers, buying and selling slaves, but with the restriction of not breaking up families. During the war, forces caused Washington to change his established planter worldview, deciding that slavery was something he no longer believed in. However, Washington took no meaningful actions during his presidency or after to change the plight of his or any other slaves. It's true that at his death, Washington freed his slaves and generously provided for them, but his failure to deal with the dower slave situation still resulted in the separation of families. He had to have known this would happen. To purchase dower slaves from the Custis family would have been costly. Still, there's no evidence that Washington attempted to negotiate some settlement that would keep the families together. There appear to be two reasons why Washington did not try to free his slaves or any other slaves during his lifetime. First, he did not want to break up families. However, this intention was weaker than needed to hold the families together. Second, he was concerned that working at a national level to free the slaves would divide and probably destroy the new republic. The persistence of the republic tipped his scales far more than abolishing slavery. Finally, some historians contend that Washington freed his slaves so he would be seen by later generations in a better light. He knew that the winds of abolitionism were increasing in strength, and Washington did not want to be on the wrong side of history. It's hard to argue with this argument, because he could have freed his slaves during his lifetime, and he could have tried to find a way to keep the family relationships between his and Martha's slaves together. But he waited until his death, and then took steps that didn't go quite far enough. So this brings us to the final question. Does this black mark on Washington's legacy, his ownership of slaves, completely wipe the slate clean, a slate that records all that he did to help create the new United States? This is something each of us must answer for ourselves, but it's always important to view what happened through an 18th century lens. Applying our 21st century worldview to what happened in the distant past is never a good approach to interpreting history. Washington was born into a slave-owning culture, a culture that molded how he saw the world. Owning slaves was just part of life for white planters of his time. However, Washington possessed enough integrity, enough humanity, to eventually understand how wrong it was to own another person. While he did not act as quickly as we might expect, he did act. That's something. Well, that's it for this video. As you can see, the topics we'll discuss in this channel will analyze both ancient and current beliefs. There's no correct answer for most of what we cover when we do this. Instead, we explore and come to tentative conclusions based on what we learn while being open to changing our beliefs when additional information becomes available. Please subscribe if you learned something or were challenged by what I covered in this video. If you want to be able to engage in in-depth discussions about the video topics and download the guides associated with the videos, while also supporting the production of these videos, please become a member of my Patreon page. Until next time, keep an open mind.